Bob Burnett, I think it's the first time we sat down we haven't had steaks in front of us. That's true. That is a true statement. Yeah. How are you, man? I'm, I'm great. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's good to get you on the podcast. I'm excited to be here. Well, listen, you should introduce yourself to the listeners. Uh, I know you. I know what you do, but let's set people up. Yeah. Well, I'm Bob Burnett. I'm the CEO of Barefoot Mining. Uh, most of my history is actually in the personal computer industry, though. So it goes way back, actually, to the late 70s. Um, we, in high school, started coding, but uh, make a, a very long story short, um, got out of school with a computer engin- engineering degree and went to work for a company called Zenith. And by a stroke of luck, was put on an assignment to develop what was, I, I believe, to be the world's first laptop computer. And very exciting project. I was a very junior member of the team. I do not want to overstate my role at that point, but still pretty cool to be part of that because I believe the personal computer revolution was kind of the seed of the internet revolution. And then then Bitcoin came on top of that, kind of all kind of going in layers. So you've got to work through them all. I did, I did. And uh, I think it gives me kind of an interesting perspective of what's going on. And I think uh, there's a lot of parallels, by the way. There's a lot of parallels between that personal computer industry and what happens in Bitcoin. Um, The rapid pace of change, kind of that gradually then suddenly thing. Mm -hmm. Because in the personal computer industry, as you probably could guess it, I got out of college in 1986. So that's when I started working on that project. Personal computers were small. You know, they were $4,000 each, um, only used in business circumstances, a very select group of people. Most people didn't realize what was coming, right? They, they, they saw it as a business tool for a select group of people and not something that was going to change everything, right? Because you, you can argue that everything in society changed, everything in government changed, everything, all our lifestyles are, are uh, changed as a result of that. And... Um, very few people saw that, but, but I did, you know, I guess if I pat myself on the back for something, it would be like, I I kind of feel like my main thing is being a technologist and being a technologist, I think is looking at, uh, science and, and engineering, but at the same time, looking at society and saying kind of how, how are these things going to come together? And, and change. So, uh, you know, there's some great ones out there. I know Steve Jobs, I think, was a great technologist. Elon Musk was a great technologist. But I think Satoshi Nakamoto maybe is the ultimate technologist. And so, because there's engineers, like there's engineers building roads and building bridges. And that's one thing. And I respect all those people in those professions. But I think the technologists are the ones that push society forward, that, that move us into new eras. Have you seen a TV series called Halt and Catch Fire? I have. I have. Yeah. Was that nostalgic for you? It was nostalgic. Um, highly accurate, actually. Yeah. Have you seen it? No, I've not watched it. You that. would love it. Well, it's, is it, it about the start like the start of the personal computing industry and oh, what they cool. were trying to develop and build? It's bloody brilliant. I, do you know what? I didn't finish it. I think I did the first season, never went back for whatever reason, but I should because I loved it. Yeah, you know, I think I did the same thing. I, I think I, I watched the first season, but for whatever I mean, that's the thing about we, the way we consume content today, right? Yeah. Like you, you sometimes lose the the edge when it comes to the second season. But you know what I will say is, you know, that era, those the the characters portrayed was very similar. There was a lot of cutthroat things going on in the business. Um, There was a phenomenal amount of ingenuity. I think that, you know, a lot of the key characters, like in any of these things, you have have different characters being played. There were the people who saw the massive economic opportunity, the capitalists, and then you had the technologists, you know, and and I was was on the technologist side. And I think the technologists, um, we're not as motivated by money, right? We, we're motiv- we, we all like money. I think anybody that said they're not is being disingenuous. But, but you know, what gets us up in the day is kind of moving this thing forward. And, and then there's a different group of people who look at something like that more with the Wall Street attitude and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
make a lot of money on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it from an, an empire building perspective. And certainly that happened in the personal computer market. It's certainly happening in the Bitcoin market. Um, it happens, it happened in the internet, it happens everywhere. It's just the nature of the beast, right? Well, so having worked through and seeing what happened with personal computers and then the internet, do you think, do you think for you, Bitcoin is even more obvious? Are you seeing the kind of, it, does it feel the same? It feels exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, my, my wife, Lola, one of the things, um, one of the things that happened to me, so I, I, I somewhat started the introduction and it eventually led to me um, leaving the company I was with, doing a startup. That startup got acquired by Gateway. Gateway was one of the top 10 personal computer companies in the world. Um, like in the year 2000, we had annual revenues of 10 billion. We had 25,000 employees. Um, I was the chief technical officer by that point. So I was in, in the C-suite of that company helping run it. We, we had gone public in 1993. So I, I got to experience that whole thing of taking a company public, of growing it into a Fortune 200 company and you know seeing all that happen. Well, when I, when I left that though, not that I was famous in any, by any means, but I had gone through what I think a lot of athletes go through or, or musicians, you know, there's a, there's a point when your star doesn't shine anymore. And I had left the industry and I had done okay financially, but I lost like, what am I here for? Like, what, what is my purpose in life? Why am I existing? And I had done a technology incubator. We were starting all these little companies doing different things. Some of them were successful. Some of them still exist today. But to be honest, none of them do anything exciting. Like, like they make money mm. like here or there. Some of them do things like technical documentation. Owners, some of the, uh, like if you, if you bought a TV at Best Buy under the house brand and you opened, opened it up, the setup guide is done by one of the companies that we developed. So they did all the usability stuff. But nothing earth shattering, right? So what my, life, my, my wife will say is that I started to kind of lose my luster, like my aura was fading personally. And in 2017 is really when I found this world again. And you know, she said there's like a rebirth for me because I had purpose. Um, I woke up every day excited, you know, I'm 59 now. So, but I, I feel- You're a good looking 59 year old, isn't oh, it? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. I, I think it's, I, I know it's all the uh, lifting you all do. All the weight lifting, yeah. yeah. Um, but but, but I, don't, I, I have that energy I had when I was 35. Mm. You know, and, and it's because of Bitcoin, because now suddenly I go, well, I know why I'm up every day. I have a, I have a purpose. And it evolved, by the way. And in 2017, it was, it was something new and exciting. So it had the newness to it, but I didn't get it completely. It took about two years. Like I think a lot of Bitcoiners, right? We start at a certain point. Um, and two, two years from 2017 or 2017 was the two-year point? No, I started in 2017. Yeah. And then about 2019. So, and I was, I was in, I was, you know, I was making money. I had started a company, but I looked at it initially the way I looked at it from a, as a computer guy. Yeah. And so, I, and the full disclosure, I'm, I'm a Bitcoin maxi now, but I started out designing Ethereum mining servers. That's okay. how I got started because somebody had contacted me knowing my background and said, Bob, can you build a whole bunch of Ethereum mining equipment for me? So I'm a computer guy. I said, sure, I can do that. And by, um, and so it was out of nowhere and it was a $6 million order, by the way. So right away, a guy wants $6 million worth of these and I know how to build them. So, okay, let's start a company and build them. So I came in, might you say through the back door, um, through a shit coin, motivated by being excited about designing technology again, but but not really here for what I, the ethos, right? About a year in, both from a technological perspective and an economic perspective and governance and all that, I, I, I saw what Ethereum was. I didn't like it. Hmm. So we pivoted toward Bitcoin. We signed a deal with Bitfury in 2018 
to be the U.S. distributor for uh, Bitfury's uh, mining equipment. And that got me going on this. But by then I started to kind of peel back the onion, like, okay, what, what's really going on technologically and, and the brilliance of Satoshi and Bitcoin still amazes me today. Mm -hmm. I'm still peeling back that onion today. Uh, and, 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 but, but, but then these social layers and social implications and the, govern, the governance mechanisms and all those sort of things impressed me equally. Uh, and and so um, you know that's that's how it changed. It changed me. And and going back to the question you asked about the personal computer market, um, yeah, it's very very similar. So you know I think we're at that point. We're still at that point, like in the early '90s. I, I feel like this having and kind of the the having, the spot ETF, those sort of things, they're culminating a lot like the introduction of Windows 95. So in, 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 in 1995, Windows 95 came out and the Pentium processor came out and the CD-ROM came out. Like all those sort of things were a confluence at the same time and they changed the personal computer market from kind of a business tool to something that went into everybody's home. I think we're at the exact same point in Bitcoin today. I think it's also... It's it's a real gift to be able to work on something which has a purpose to it as well. So like my background was advertising. I loved the advertising industry. I loved the challenge of creativity, but there was no real purpose. Yeah. It wasn't like we were making the world a better place. We were taking contracts to help people sell more shit that other people doesn't don't really need. And right. And with Bitcoin, there's this kind of... You're not just building a company, you, you join a community. I mean, we've bumped into each other, hung out a few times, and you become friends. And you know, you, you, I, know, I know in the next however many years, I'm going to bump into you 10 times. Yes. And we're going to hang out. So you get that whole community. You've got this kind of joint purpose. You, you, you're trying to make the world a better place. It, it, it's, it's a real gift to be able to work and earn money on something that has purpose. Oh, for sure. And by the way, that's a radical difference from the personal computer industry because the personal computer industry, while we all had a common alliance, my counterparts at Dell or at Compaq or HP, we were fierce rivals. Well, are we fierce rivals with our counterparts in the shit coins? Oh, okay, okay. That I will agree with. But for instance, the CEOs of other mining companies, I may have different, I, I definitely do have philosophical differences with them, but they're not my enemies. I don't wish them ill. I'm not trying to steal market share from them. But you need them. I think we all need each other. I think we all play a role in this. And yeah, so um, that's true. Well, it's more like um, Dell would love to have had a monopoly on the distribution of laptops, but we can't have miners have a monopoly on mining. That's correct. Because it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. It's it's extremely dangerous. And you know, we all play a role in the ecosystem. And you know, some of us come at it, I, I come at it as a technologist with my background. Other people come from the power industry. Some people come from capital markets and in, in New York. Um, um, so we do approach it differently. And like I said, it, it it results in different philosophical approaches to mining. Um, you know, and I my I'm somewhat averse, as some people know, you may know, I'm somewhat averse to Wall Street and public markets and the, the perception I have of the chains that come with that. I think they, they're very, very difficult. And I say that as a guy who did it, right? Mm. It's, not, it's not somebody talking, like, I know what changed inside the culture of my company. And it had phenomenal benefits. And it also had phenomenal downsides. And at this point in my life, I don't want to deal with those downsides, hmm. you know, even if it means I'm smaller. And I think that's some things too, like some people, having been involved in technology a long time, some people, especially I think when you're younger, your, your, your belief is like, I have to be big, I have to, go, I have to be the king of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then as you get a little older, hopefully a little wiser, you realize like, well, no, you can't measure your success that way. It's not about your market share or how, how, how much hash rate you have or like those sort of things. It's about, you know, it's about, are you contributing? It's, it's about, um, 
playing a role within this ecosystem. I mean, that's how I look at it. Like I, I have to play a role. And, and I think the role I play, which is kind of in the small to medium-sized minor market, which, which as you said, I think we all play a role in this ecosystem needs this diversity. Um, somebody has to be a spokesperson for that. Somebody has to be an advocate for it. And that's the role I'm taking. I, I think also it's one of those things that happen when you get older, because I, you know, I'm starting to feel like I'm older. <laughs> Right. I'm a few years younger than you, Bob, but I am starting to feel like I'm older. I'm 45. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to think about, okay, the, the, the horizon where I kind of retire and slow down is not far away. I can see it. Mm -hmm. And so I think what tends to happen is you become really conscious of the value of time and the scarcity of time. Yeah. Um, and time is a weird scarcity because you don't actually know how much you've got. <laughs> it could be yeah. one day or it could be 20, 30, 40 more years. You just yeah. don't know. And and I think when you're younger, you have all that energy because you think, if I do this, I'll make all this money, I'll make you happy. And actually, it doesn't really. And then you become aware of time and using time to be happy in the present rather. Like yeah. when you're young, you're, you're trying to make happiness in the future. Mm -hmm. and I think as you get older, you, you're trying to make happiness now. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's actually really wise. Because what I can say is, I, I, I mentioned, I... I had a small company. It was acquired by Gateway before Gateway IPO'd. And so I got a lot of stock. I got a lot of stock options. There you go. Um, did very well. Uh, by the late 90s, I started cashing out. I had some really good years. Um, it's public information. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the things. When you're a C suite executive, your stock sales and all that, so people can go look it up if they're interested. So I had some really good years. What I can say is that. Some of my most unhappy years followed that immediately. And is it when you got divorced? Yeah, I did. I did. I got <laughs> okay, divorced. Same for me. You know, and so like the money had nothing to do with anything, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 so you reevaluate all those priorities and then you, you, you kind of start resetting it. And, you know, I, you know, I, I'm at a point now where I think I have a pretty good understanding of what makes me happy and fulfilled and what I want to accomplish too. And luckily, Bitcoin ticks a whole bunch of those boxes. Mm. No, whole, I get it. Like Bob, when I got divorced at that time was my wealthiest time up until then. I was comfortable, business was doing well. You know, we had 45, not huge, but 45 staff, felt successful. And my marriage collapsed and I was miserable and yeah. no amount of money was going to fix that. You could, you could knock on the door the next day and go, here, Pete, here's $10 million. Here's $100 million. I was miserable. So like, yeah. I empathize with that fully. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But these, are, but these are very good years for me. I, I you know, because I didn't, I didn't know that I would ever get this chance again. Like, it's kind of like a, I, I use this analogy to a rock star. I think when athletes and rock stars, like you see all these catastrophic stories, right? They, mm -hmm. they have this great career and then they're dead or they're in a rehab or they're in a, you know, whatever, because you can't deal with the backside. Like you, you, you had this period where, you know, you had this purpose and everybody's telling you how great you are and all these things have come together for you and then it's gone. And that's kind of what happened to me in my own way after I left the personal computer industry. And but now I don't have that anymore. I, I now I feel like I'm back. I have I have purpose. Bob and, is back. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. yeah and do you think um, not to be kind of like hyperbolic, but do you think Bitcoin has anything to do with that? Because I, I one of the things I love about Bitcoin is the the things it teaches you about again time yourself. The world, I, it forces you down so many rabbit holes that you kind of, you kind of have to kill your ego and learn and accept a few things. And mm -hmm. like, it's an ongoing process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hundred percent support that position. <laughs> but you know, I, I think if if I was to, I told you I started in Bitcoin in twenty seventeen, right? Yeah. So I would say at that point, if I was to rank the things in my life that were important to me, Bitcoin might have been number 10, hmm. let's say. I'm, I'm making that, I haven't actually made the list, but you know, there have been several things in my life. Now I would say it's number two. Behind? Behind my family. 
Yeah. You know, and, and I, I'll, I'll include a few close friends in that circle. Like, mm-hmm. but I will not compromise anything else in my life if, if, if it hurts Bitcoin. Like, so if, if I make a business decision or a personal decision and the impact would have something negative on Bitcoin, at least my perception of it, then I won't do it. Huh. That's really interesting. I'm paused for thought because I'm thinking, have I made those decisions? And I think there's certain decisions along the path of this podcast I wouldn't have made if I'd have thought like that. That's a really, that's a really interesting way to think about it. Even if it's a minor. Even if it's minor. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. And, and even at that, the reason my family and, and Bitcoin being in that number two position, a lot of my passion for Bitcoin is, I, like I have five grandkids now. So I have even a sixth one on the way. Congratulations. Thank you. So, but now you think about that. So I have a grandchild that's going to be born in the year 2024. He or she is likely to be alive in the vicinity of the time the last Bitcoin is mined. Or maybe forever. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. that world. Well, well yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a different rabbit hole. But yeah, so so that could happen. So I have to think about, uh, and I've said this publicly a few times, one of, one of the things I think I can contribute to this is thinking as a technologist, thinking as a systems guy. And, and I believe what we're trying to build is a monetary system that will last a thousand years. And... A lot of us get forced into short-term thinking. Um, what's going to mm-hmm. happen before the happening? Like, like, like we're, we're in this bubble. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's wrong. But stepping back sometimes and looking at the longer horizon. So what I'm saying is like, hey, uh, maybe the last thing I can do on this earth of significance, at least to society, is to help Bitcoin position itself to be that money for a thousand years because I want that grandchild and, and his or her children to live in a world that's free, that doesn't have the, the burden of this monetary system that steals from it every day. Um, and, and so that's my gift. That's, mm. that's what I can do with my time. And so then I come back to that, like, hey, if I do something, if I make a decision that benefits me in the short term, but creates some resistance to Bitcoin, then I'm hurting my family. I'm hurting, you know, I'm hurting these people that I love. And I, I couldn't live with myself with that. So, mm. so I'm going to think about what you said there a lot in the future. Definitely. So wh- why do you think it is that mining's grabbed you so much as the area that you focus on? Well, I'm a, first of all, I'm a hardware guy. Mm-hmm. So... I can touch and feel it, right? And so uh, that that aspect. But I think the other aspect of it is I, I view it as the heartbeat, like the heartbeat and the cadence of everything we do is controlled through the mining process, and it fascinates me. Um, I believe there are ways because, like I said, I, I don't want to mislead people and say I'm here all for altruistic reasons. I like to make money still. Um, I believe there are ways of making money and using some of the skills I have and knowledge I have to, to create some advantages um, that allow me to, to be very profitable with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really the, this kind of this mystique. Like it's, it's on the surface, it sounds very simple, but when you peel back the onion, you know, like how does mining really work? How do these processes go from a hardware wallet into the mempool and get chosen and a miner picks them and they get added to the blockchain? And there's all kinds of things that are built into that that I just I just really dig. It just really gets me <laughs> off. When we were having dinner in where were we? Why can't I not remember? We were in LA. Oh, we yeah, were in, in LA, LA yeah. Pacific. With um we were with uh, Natalie Ma- and Matteo. And, and Matteo from Mateo. Orange Bell. Yeah. yeah. You talk, we didn't dig into it, but I want to dig into it now. You talked about this mining, mining trilemma. Hmm. Can you talk to me about that? Because I think yeah. this is fascinating. Yeah. So if you want to build a mining site, 
any point in time, three things fundamentally have to come together. One is a source of energy, consistent and competitive source of energy. The second is the mining equipment, the servers, and, and maybe secondarily some of the electrical pieces, and money. And what I learned after doing this for a little while is that at any point in time, one of them is always hard. <laughs> and it moves. It's, it's a living, breathing sort of thing. And so uh, two years ago, as we were sitting kind of just on the backside of the China mining ban and money was flowing into mining everywhere. Money was so easy. But the cost of the and availability of the equipment was terrible. You, you couldn't get it, or if you could get it, it was so overpriced. Fast forward a year, those two have flipped positions, right? They have flipped positions by by this time in 2022, still somewhat in that today. The money's hard to get, but ironically, the equipment is very available and very nicely valued. Uh, now, energy can play into that too. Energy didn't move a lot in mm -hmm. that, but it certainly could. You know, that I'm sure we'll see energy availability get tight at some point here, uh, potentially in this next uh, epoch. Mm. I think we'll see it get tight. So um, I'm not a big Warren Buffett fan, but Warren Buffett has a, uh, a phrase that I always liked, which was, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And I think that that is a lesson for all of us in mining. The best time to be expanding in mining has been the last year. Uh, and, and, and my company in our own small way, and by the way, the choice of not being public has meant Capital's harder for us to get. We have to raise it, raise it privately. Right. And so that restricts us. Um, but we did a pretty good job this year. I think in a, in a difficult conditions, we did a pretty good job. And we've expanded a lot and we've refreshed kind of all the technology in our mining as a result of it. But we were facing the trilemma, right? Like staring that right in the face of, of having to raise money in this really difficult market. But the good news was once we got the money, the fact that we had money, the, the, the offers we were able to get on the equipment were fantastic. And we were able to deploy very, very quickly. I had a talk with my team just this last week and I said, there's gonna be a point here, it hasn't happened yet, but my guess is sometime in the next year, we'll face a point where the trilemma will have flipped on us. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is we have to have the discipline when the people are trying to throw money at us to say no when the value has flipped, right? There's a point at which the cost per terahash or the amount you're going to spend on the energy is too high, and we have to have the discipline to say no. Or can you say yes and sit on your hands, hold that capital to the next time it flips? Well, that's, some, that's something we'd have to arrange with the investors, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I guess that's where... This time I'm armed a little better because of things like I've published some, like you talked about the trilemma and people are aware of it. So maybe I can talk to them and say, hey, yeah. there's, a, there's a play here. It's not the one you were probably thinking, but... It is the play. It is the play, right. As long as the cycles repeat themselves. Because it's funny, I mean, I'm on my, am I on my third cycle now? 2017? Yeah, I guess I'm in my third. Yeah. Halfway through this my third This is the our one. third, yeah. Yeah, and... I still made a lot of mistakes in the second one that I made in the first one. <laughs> this time will be different. And I still think I'll make some of them still this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what's hard is, you know, the this euphoria. Yeah. But, you know, we talked about the personal computer industry. I'll tell you, this is one of the things I think that helped me develop this theory was in the personal computer industry. Imagine, imagine it is 1993 or 1994. And there are 10 prominent personal computer companies in the world. And we all see this explosion about to occur, mm -hmm. right? Like I said, Windows 95 was a huge pivot point for those of you who are younger, you may not remember it well, but it was kind of when personal be computing became easy. And we had, we had some of the internet just starting to kind of happen. The processes were getting to a point where they were really quick. But anyway, all the personal computer companies saw this, right? So at that point in time, 
all the personal computer companies went out into the supply base of hard drives and DRAM and started making massive commitments, each assuming not only that the market would grow, but that they were seeing it in front of the other people. Mm. And somebody with 7% market share was thinking they were going to go to 11. Somebody with 14 thought they were going to go to 17. So what happened? They, they put all this capital in, got the supply base all hyped up, and there's still only 100% market share. <laughs> and we had you know, the 10 companies thinking there was effectively going to be 130% market share. It didn't happen. So there was, a, there was a big correction. There were winners and losers, and it flushed out a whole bunch of people um, or companies in that, in that cycle. So I think we have to be careful with that, by the way, in, in our world, too. In fact, I was, I was, uh, there's a guy named uh, Yaren Melarud. He's an analyst with Luxor. Good guy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we see a lot of things very similarly. And he put out a tweet just in the last day, and he said, he said all the mining companies I talk to are expecting the hash rate to drop post the halving. None of them think it will be them, though. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it was very reminiscent of the story I just told you that, like, all the mining companies think they're going to live and survive on the back half of the halving, um, and they're going to grow their hash rate, but somehow the whole market's going to drop. So, anyway. <laughs> Do you think it's going to be a bloodbath? I think it all depends on the price. Okay, of course. All depends on the price. What would be like a bottom end but a healthy price for the mining industry? Um, low. I'll put it at the low side of it. Low fifties. Okay. For in the low fifties, I don't think we'll have too many dead bodies. Right. Um, so. <laughs> but if but if we're maybe low forties, it gets challenging. Yeah. What does that do to the trinema? Does it mean there's a bunch of equipment will be available? Yeah, it, it Some does. Consolidation? But it's the wrong equipment. Right. So I, I think that equipment turns mostly to trash. Um, so, you know, now some of it has good energy tied to it. So if you're, if you're a big, if you're a big miner today mm -hmm. um, and I think we're seeing a lot of them, the big miners right now, we're seeing them trying to get their fleets up with more modern, efficient equipment. Because like, I, I know from friends in the industry, like there's still people out there with S17s or 80 terahash per second S19s. Those aren't going to make it. Mm -hmm. like, I, can, I can tell you, short of, let's say, $100,000 Bitcoin, none of that's going to make it. So... Um, just in crude terms, like for the audience out there, like if you have something 110 terahash per second or lower, that's pretty suspect on the back half of the halving, short of some price explosion or a fee explosion, by the way. That, that's the other potential savior. Yeah. How, long, how much longer people are buying ordinals for? Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. But that's a... <sighs> I don't think it's something... We can rely on? No. You, you, I, I, I've done a lot of studies on this. Yeah. And I have to, right? Because traditionally, if you're a miner and you're, and you're looking at, let's say, putting some money into some sort of expansion, you, you have a model and you develop it. And there are certain knowns. Like we know, give or take just a couple hundred blocks, there's 53,500 blocks per year. So just a nice little number to know. Mm -hmm. And so if we're in a cycle like the one we've been with six and a quarter Bitcoin as the block reward, you can very quickly do the calculation of at least from a Bitcoin metric, how much Bitcoin is coming into the market. Um, especially because fees are pretty low. Now, interesting little metric too is I, I, um, I had a member of my team, we went in and we, we went all the way back to the Genesis block we, we pulled the whole data, kind of built our own little glass node-like mm -hmm. uh, tool because there were certain metrics we weren't getting from them that we wanted. So we just went in and did it ourselves. And one of the things I learned was that um, over the entire life of Bitcoin, the average fees per block is 0.335. Hmm. Okay. Now, th this is data as of about the end of August. 0.335 Bitcoin. 0.335 Bitcoin. A third is, of a Bitcoin. Yeah, for every block. Hmm. 
between March and August, I haven't updated it, so I, I do have to do that, but between March and August, so relatively recent data, the average was 0.335. So it's very fascinating to me that in the entire length of Bitcoin and the most recent six month period, exactly the same to the, what is that, the 100th or 1,000th place, the exact same amount of fees were being generated. Now, as a percentage of the revenue for the miners then though, obviously it was 0.335 when it was 50 and it's 0.335 when it was six and a quarter. Will it be 0.335 when it's 0.3125 as the block reward? So meaning fees would then, if that was true, then fees become about 10% of the minor revenue, even just using the historical baseline. That's an increase. Yeah, a big increase. And if we get to a million dollars a Bitcoin, by the time where the block reward is a lot lower, you could be having 300,000-ish, $335,000 in block reward based on fees, which makes it a viable industry, which is counter to the entire conversation where people are saying, well, what happens when the block reward ends? Yes. Yeah. I have no concerns about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, And by the way, I think... You're absolutely correct that fees have spiked. Okay, mm-hmm. and and they're they're by the way right now as we speak. I checked it this morning. I checked this like almost it's every high, day, as you probably can guess. But um, the average for the last several days has been about 0.75. Wow. So miners are happy. I haven't met yeah. a miner yet who uh, dislikes ordinals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are those big squares ordinals? Uh, um, most likely, most likely they are. But what yeah, it, it looks what, like it's like between yeah. 0.75 you, and a bit. If you click fees. Danny on the hammer in the upper left, and then um, scroll down and see latest blocks, see see what the reward is there. It's seven point two two. Yeah, so you so can that's, see. Is that a Bitcoin in that you, one? But the, in pretty in much fees, almost so, yeah. yeah. In fees, it's around. Well, uh, 0.75. Yeah. So seven Bitcoin yeah. reward would be 0.75, and you've seen several of them much higher. So with what the, this what the hell are they sending around to do that? The, it's part it's part of it. But here's the thing. So I I believe, this is my interpretation of it, that block space itself is much scarcer than people think about. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I, I gave a speech at BitBlock Boom this year on this topic. And the summary of it is. I mentioned earlier today, like I have this number off the top of my tongue, 53,500 blocks per year. It's a mm-hmm. strange thing to have at the front of your mind. But part of it is that I've also looked at what's the average number of transactions per block. So, and, and by the way, all the blocks are completely full. Um, those, the, the, the mempool that Danny's got pulled up right here is showing every block is full. And that's been true all year long, by the way. They're completely full. So you've, for th- count, you've calculated how many transactions a year the network can take. Correct. Which is? Which is, at current circumstances, about 150 million per year. It's and not a lot when you think there's 8 billion people here. Exactly. Now, I believe what would happen is it would probably creep up naturally to about 200 million because people would get more efficient. Yeah. In other words, yeah. if I owe you and Danny both money, Right now, I make it sloppy, and I'll send I'll send Pete this much, and I'll have another transaction to sell Danny this much. But in the future, I might go well. I'm going to send those both in the same transaction, mm. right? So I can I can get a little more efficient. But um, still, how but, many Visa transactions are but, in the world every year? Oh yeah, that, so yeah, yeah. So that's I mean, you're, I think you're getting the reality that I'm trying to project here is that. First, if, if let's say there was a generous uh, Bitcoin benefactor and he said, hey, he or she said, I want to give everybody some Bitcoin. Those 8 billion people, it would take 40 years to get every person their Bitcoin <laughs> with the network doing nothing else. <laughs> so not going to happen. Now, there's a lot of ramifications of this. One is that I believe block space is almost full. The mempool, which again, Danny had that pulled up. Right now, it's the backlog is about 200,000. Can we see that, Danny? So if you go to the far uh, far side of that, yeah. So it's, what does that say, 192 plus the other ones. So it's about 200 
thousand yeah. transactions in the backlog. Wow. Um, there are some other places where you can check it and you'll see that that number, it's been that way since the beginning of the year. It's never cleared. It's been completely full. Now, the people, there's obviously two components. There's demand for the transaction and there's the urgency of the transaction, mm -hmm. right? So right now we're seeing not tremendous urgency on a lot of the transactions, mm -hmm. right? Um, other than the ordinals folks, I believe. I believe they've, they've won urgency. And by the way, there's some interesting things when you peel back a, a little bit into this. If you look at, for instance, Binance, if you pull a Binance block up, typically it'll be very different from what's called the expected block. So mempool, what mempool does is it'll say, hey, there's all these transactions in there and we can calculate what we would expect the next block to look like mm -hmm. if, somebody, yeah. if somebody just picked the most expensive ones that would fit in the block. It's like the most economical block, right? Yeah. But then, and there's a measurement of, of how different it is, the, the, the health of the block, it's called. But sometimes you'll see radical differences. And Binance, by the way, is one of the ones where you'll see the most common ones. Well, why is that? I'm pretty sure, I can't say 100%, I'm pretty sure it's because what they're doing is they're saying, hey, we're going to do all of our transactions at minimum fee, and we're going to pick them. Right, so that's one of the powers of being a miner, a, a miner well. um, especially a mining pool. Today, we can talk about this later. The mining pools make those decisions today. So, Binance is a miner and a pool. The pools are picking the block templates today. So, they're going in, putting their own stuff in, even though it's really cheap, because it saves them money, mm -hmm. right? And then fitting whatever else in after that. Huh. Interesting. So, they can put themselves at the back of the queue and still get picked. Yes, correct. That's one of the powers of being a mining pool yeah. today, um, as that, that ability to choose. So going forward, though, I, I, I give this little example sometimes. So I believe block space is a commodity. So, so think of it, that's the way I choose to think about it. I think it is a commodity. And like Bitcoin, it's essentially absolutely scarce in any time window. So I can say for the year 2024, I can already calculate it. I can tell you how much block space is available and we can translate that to transactions, which we did, like there's 150 million transactions. So the whole world's gonna compete for that space of those 150 million. Hmm. We will, largely see it go to the highest bidder, but not always because of the situation that I just talked about. Mm. Now, how expensive does it get? Nobody knows. In all my models, I still use the 0.335. I just, I don't, but, but there's a part of me that says there's a distinct possibility that number goes up materially. And, and I, I look at like what's happening right now where fees are averaging about 0.75, well over twice the historical norm. And I think that's a case of scarcity. So scarcity is a nonlinear function, right? It, if, if uh, this is an example I give, said if I, if I have an apple tree, it's the only apple tree in the world, and it produces 100 apples a day, if only 95 people in the world want apples, the price of those apples is really cheap. But the moment 101 people per day want my apples, price of the apples goes up a lot. Hmm. At 120, it goes up even more, right? At 200, it goes up even more. Well, I believe the Bitcoin block space is like an apple tree with demand for about 95 apples per day. That, that's where we sit. So it won't take much to, to push us up, into yeah. this point where the fees go nuts. And then that has big ramifications, right? So a lot of the things that we preach, rightfully so, um, but like not your keys, not your Bitcoin, we have to kind of maybe reshape them a little bit for the class of 2024, let's say, because, uh, or the class of 2026, because it is impossible for everybody to do that. You know, I, I, it's not what I want. It's just impossible for billions. For billions, right? I'm not saying any 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 individual that wants to pay for it can. Well, so but, there, there are two things there. It, in that 
there's one the network doesn't have the block space uh, to actually allow everyone the time to do that. But is there a secondary thing in that block space could get so expensive that somebody who wants to come in and start buying $100 a a week or a month, even if they want to consolidate those UTXOs over into a hardware wallet, it's going to be too expensive on the fees. Like if we yeah. are edging out low, you know, the people who can only, because f- we, yeah. we hear it. So I've, you, I, tra- you know, I travel a lot with this. And, yeah, sure. You know, I've been out to uh, places where people, yeah. they don't have much money. And people yeah, say, if you're well, in Lebanon look, or Argentina, yeah. I know you've been there. So, so people are like, well, they should save a dollar, five dollars, you know, swap a can of Coke. It's like, it's all one and good. But, you know, if they can only do five dollars and the cost of uh, a transaction is ten dollars, they, they can't do it. And so the only thing, which by the way, it's still a question I've not had properly answered for me. Are we going to head to a world where a lot of people don't have UTXOs? They are, uh, they're getting onboarded onto the Lightning Network. And can they be self-sovereign on the Lightning Network? Because they're really sharing someone's UTXO. So yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's some big questions here to answer. Yeah. Well, I can answer part of it, I think, yeah. which is I believe only something like Lightning will allow the world to get a taste of Bitcoin. Mm. The good news is they're in the, I would still consider them in the ecosystem. um, But are they sovereign? But they don't have that level of sovereignty. That's Mm. correct. And, and, you know, I think that's why you have, you have people like, like what's happening with Fetty and, you know, Fetty Mint trying to create some form of comfort um, with, it's the like custody. Commu- that's but a kind of community sovereignty. Community, community custody. Um, which is, which but, is that community sovereignty then? Do you become sovereign as a community, but not an individual? Because that's a, I, I hadn't heard that expression. I think that's I, a good way to look at it. I just made it up now. Yeah. Well, it, it might stick because I think that's what you did. I mean, the base layer is the base layer for a reason, and it's not replicable at these other at these other levels. It's the only place in the world. I mean, that has this, right? I mean, it's, it's Satoshi's unique creation. It's very limited, though. And, and I believe the, when we look at the block size wars and the things that happened, the, the right thing happened. Mm-hmm. I believe that. But there are ramifications to it, and that's that not everybody can live on the base layer. Even people like us, I think, will. I interact with it fairly regularly right now, um, and you may too. But... As time goes by, it'll probably become less frequent because of these fees. Um, it, it. I know what you mean. So I've started to think about how I need to kind of disem- like spread out my Bitcoin custody. Yeah. You know, we. I think most people thinking to, in terms of levels, it's like the majority of my stacks deep cold storage multi sig. I then will have. Uh, the stuff I may want to use on a week by week basis in a single SIG hardware wallet, and then there's some like day to day travel money that goes in a Lightning wallet, yeah. and, and and there's some mixtures of those. But I have started to think about scenarios whereby maybe that middle one gets wiped out because that is a base chain hardware wallet, yeah. and that needs to go into some kind of either collaborative custody or side chain or somewhere where I can. Move it around without even thinking about it. I think Feddy is. I didn't get Feddy at first, and and I think when I first heard about Feddy, for me it was meant to be solving this issue of people, you know, in communities who ha- wanted a custody and maybe didn't have the technology. Actually, I think it's solving the problem of people n- being priced out of owning UTXOs. Yeah, I think that's a bigger problem that needs solving, um, and it, but it does mean some form of community sovereignty. And yeah. we don't understand how the rules of that really will work. And will someone try and rug their community and how we prevent that? That is like a whole new era we have to go through. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, if I was a, a young person wanting to be involved in Bitcoin, I think that's where I would probably go focus. I would say, hey, how, how do I go solve this problem of the fact that, you know, we have right, right now, we know there's about 50 million addresses that have some level of Bitcoin value in it. So even if all 50 million were associated with a person, we know that's not true, but bear Mm -hmm. with me. 
you know, we're dealing with, what is that number? It's like 0.15% of the world's population is working on the base layer right now. And we're essentially full. <laughs> so, yeah. And so we're running a 200,000 unit backlog and fees have spiked to 0.75 just on a little ordinals craze, right? It didn't take much. So, so this is imperative. I mean, the, the people doing work at Lightning and, and whether it's, you know, different non-custodial wallets or, or Lightning LSPs or Fedi or, you know, Liquid or like all these things, I think, perform an important function in the ecosystem. And people are going to have to get comfortable with them. I know um, I said before I'm a maxi. Some people might say, well, you're not a back maxi, Bob, because you're not telling everybody that they can or that they should go store everything on the base layer. But I'm just dealing with the mathematical reality that that's not possible. Why, do you, why do you think people aren't talking about this as much? It seems to be a, a like an elephant in the room, a blind yeah. spot that people have. Because me and Danny have talked about this a bunch of times. We we keep saying, like, keep it in the question out there. Can you be self sovereign on the Lightning Network? And we always come back to the fact that you can't. You can't. Well, you can't really be, can you? No, you can't. And cannot. so, if you can't be, that there is a like a reality here that we cannot have eight billion self sovereign Bitcoiners. Correct. So then, if if you come to that conclusion you accept that then i think you have to come to a reality that well what are we building here i think we are rebuilding the financial system on bitcoin it, it's, it will be better but there will still be trusted custody solutions maybe it's a you know, multi-party custody but we're, we're building something therefore it's the same but different it's better yeah. because we have 21 million we're fixed so we don't yeah. have the theft we Correct. don't have the debasement yeah but we still will have trusted yeah. third parties. Yeah, that's the reality. And like you said, why is nobody talking about it? I mean, it's partly why I, I gave that speech at Bitblock Boom and I've started to try to say this is because, frankly, I wasn't seeing anybody else doing it. Like, hey, I think this is an issue that has to be addressed. And, and at least, I shouldn't say addressed, because it is the architecture of the system. I shouldn't mm. say it's even an issue, right? It's just the reality of what we have. And there was a choice that was made. Like, so what we, what we maintain is an option for self-sovereignty. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and only the architecture we have allows that. And, and the architecture right now says that, one, the mining industry will continue to have enough uh, revenue to create and maintain a secure network. But number two, it's only this architecture that allows individuals to run nodes. Because go back to the block size war, well, what could we do? Well, we could make bigger blocks, but it very quickly accelerates into nodes not being something that people can have. So, well, but but also that when you discuss the scarcity of block space, the scarcity of block space allows the fees to cover for the drop that we're going to see in the block reward. If we didn't correct. have a scarce block space, yeah, I mean that's not one hundred percent true because there's a chance maybe you double the block space and therefore you double the transactions and so you get more in there at a lower price. I mean, yeah. I don't know mathematically if that would work out. It doesn't really, I, I played this in my head, and I think that things will happen. Okay, we'll figure out ways to be more efficient on transactions. Yeah. So the 150 million I talked about, it might turn into 400 million or 600 million, but it doesn't, it, it's not going to be 8 billion. It's, or, and even 8 billion isn't enough, by the way. 8 billion transactions enough annually is not enough for a hyper Bitcoinized hyper Bitcoinized, Bitcoinized world to exist, like at the base layer, we would need a multiple of that. So it's not going to happen. Um, the miners are going to be motivated exclusively by these fees. Hmm. But I think one thing to think about is when we use the word subsidy, most of the time, I think we leap to the conclusion that Satoshi put the subsidy in for the miners. But I believe it was broader 
that it was a subsidy for all of us. So we could think of the first 15 years of Bitcoin as an introductory period where it keeps fees low, it keeps fees low and, and, and oh. it's got us to this adoption level. And so it's like, um, I gave this example once. I said, um, I don't know if you had this in uh, where you grew up, Peter, but when I was a kid, um, they had the record of the month club. And so in the back of a magazine, you could pick like 12 albums for a penny. And then you had to buy one every month for like $16. Yeah, right? we had similar. Yeah, I mean, they kind of did it with CDs as well. So we yeah. had a thing called Britannia. I don't know if you know this, but like yeah. you would subscribe and you could pick four or five to begin with or yeah. six, whatever, yeah. and you get them in the post immediately. Yeah. Every month you bought one. Yeah. I yeah. Same. And it was, it was exciting, right? Like, like yeah. I, I'm a, I know you're a music person. Yeah. I'm a music person. Like I would get this package with all these, you know, first it was albums, then it was CDs, but it was very exciting. But then the reality would set in like, hey, I got to, as a teenager, like, hey, I got to cough up like 15 bucks a month to buy this other thing. Now, in total, it was still a pretty good value mm. and I was happy I did it. But the first 15 years of Bitcoin were like that introductory period, mm. you know, that, and it's about over. Now, is it over next Tuesday? Maybe not, but I have a feeling it's over in the next year or so that in the, in the next epoch, in this next having cycle, I think it will be over, and I think the fees, the fees will start skyrocketing. Now, at some point, I think they will become face melting. Now, not necessarily in that epoch, but with BlackRock ETFs and all these people hopefully onboarding, it will dramatically change the landscape of fees. But it has to because, you know, the subsidy. Has dropped by 95, 96%, oh, 94%, excuse me. Mm. The subsidy will have dropped from the original in Bitcoin terms by 94%. I amazed my son with that the other day because we, we were talking about it. He's gradually getting more and more into Bitcoin and yeah, he's talking about you know, how many Bitcoin there are. And he said, like, how many, yeah, he was kind of asking really. He's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, how many Bitcoin are there? He said, 20, and like he said, the 21 million. I said, no, there isn't, there isn't. There will be 21 million, and we can argue whether or not they already exist or not. But, yeah. uh, you know, the last ones won't. We were talking about the last ones. That was it. We were talking about the last ones don't come out till 2140. It's like, oh, well, how many have there been so far then? Is it like a few million? I was like, no, it's like 19 and a half million. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, there's only another one and a half million about to be mined. He's like, what? Yeah. And he couldn't understand. So then we had to explain the halving. Yeah. But it, it did make me think, and I've thought about this a few times, Bob. I've tried to wonder how Satoshi got everything so right. Because actually, the adoption curve is about what you don't, you don't want too fast adoption because it makes it unusable and difficult and mm -hmm. not everyone can get access. It feels like Satoshi got everything right, almost. I know not everything because there were some early changes, yeah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. There's some mistakes. Yeah. But, and then I was like, did Satoshi get everything right or did he, did he get one thing right? Did he understand incentives and just built the incentive model and everything is derived from that? I mean, I don't know the answer, but it's just, yeah. it's incredible how, not, how, not how right, because he could have changed designs. Like he could have done 40 million coins. He could have done a halving every two years. He could have been, you know, a quarter and whatever, and it still worked. But it's, it's, a, it's kind of incredible how it has worked. It, it is. That, that's, I... I, I as a, as an engineer, as a technologist, I look at it and I just am amazed because he did. I actually think he did get it right. Like the twenty one million, I think looks like exactly the right number, and the issuance schedule, whatever you want to call it, right? Amazing. Um, you know, we, there's about a million and a half left, right? So we're at mm -hmm. nine point five. You know, so half of those will come in the next cycle. I mean, that's the way that that <laughs> works, right? So half of the one point five left will be in this cycle. Um, so by the time we hit about twenty thirty, um, a million of the million and a half left will be there. So we'll spend from twenty thirty to um, uh, twenty one forty ish. You know, working on the last half million. It's so incredible, really. It's incredible, yeah. But and which of those things, if he hadn't got right, maybe it didn't work. Like if the oh, yeah. maybe if the issuance schedule had been just consistent, a certain, like yeah. the same the way 
maybe something wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But it, it is a it's a monetary policy essentially with two rules. It's fixed twenty one million and a half in issuance every four years. I mean it's it's so brilliantly fucking simple. It's amazing. I, I believe what you like religiously. Um, I, I'm not a real religious person. I'm a spiritual person, but I believe whatever you believe in, you know, that Satoshi was divinely inspired. And that's the way I look at it. It's not a religion. We shouldn't worship it. Mm-hmm. But there was something out there because f- for one man or woman, or even if it was a small group of people, to do all that and get so much right so quickly is amazing. You know, well, he did. St- he stood on the shoulder of giants. You know, yes, there was good work done before him. Yeah, but even like Adam Back, who I know just a little bit and and certainly respect a lot. You know, Adam. Adam will say when I first heard about it, I spent the first year trying to find the flaw, and every time I thought I found something, it turned out he was Satoshi was right, and. I have my own experience with that same thing, right? And and um, you know, Adam certainly has phenomenal technical credentials. Um, I'll let the world decide what mine are, but I was the CTO of a Fortune 200 company, so I, said, I have something, right? Mm. And I look at it and go, "It's flipping amazing!" Like uh, that he got all of this right. Because if you take something like um, a laptop computer. Okay, designing a laptop computer. Um, And we would have a whole team of engineers spending months designing this. And again, building on the shoulders of giants, right? I'm not talking about building the first one even. I'm talking about building subsequent generations. We would screw stuff up. You know, we would get things wrong. And um, he never, he really never fundamentally got anything wrong. It's amazing. Hmm. Uh, I mean, this is a fascinating how we've got into this because this isn't at all what I plan to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it, it is nice to just like sit back sometimes and just appreciate what it is. And, yeah. and we say all of that and then throw into the mix that this design is so brilliant. We all believe it's the most important technology certainly to work on right now, perhaps ever. Yeah. We all look at the incentives and think it will make the world a better place. And Satoshi did it without wanting any recognition. Yeah, I often, I often sit there and think, well, I wonder. I mean, if if he, she, whoever, is still alive, and I do believe it's one person. I think it's this hard secret to keep with more than one. And I, I think agree. Satoshi would have known that. I agree. If he sat there having a margarita somewhere, going, "Fucking hell, this is great." I don't you hope so? Yeah, I do. Don't you really hope so? Yeah, I, I, that, I, I, you know, if if I had like a there's a lot of things, but like it, it, on my last day, I don't want to say it's my last thing. Like on my last day, if somebody could whisper in my ear who Satoshi was and what they did after this, like that would be, that would be like the mystery I would want <laughs> uncovered mm. um, on my deathbed. And I wouldn't tell anybody, but are they happy? I, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. But I, I, um, you guys have met my wife Lola, and um, we work with the Bitcoin trading cards people. Yeah. And through that um, relationship, one of the cards in the series is called Mother Satoshi. And it came from kind of a combination of something Lola and I worked on with Aladdin, who's the founder. And um, there's a card in there called Mother Satoshi. And we ended up developing a character. And the, the genesis of the character was that for so- Satoshi to develop this thing, like a child, like and, and grow it and build it and then walk away with no reward is something only a mother could do. Like it's what a mother does with a child, right? Yeah. And that's, that's really the only parallel we can think of. And so there's some argument like that, that, that Satoshi certainly has a feminine quality at a minimum to be able to do that because it's not the attribute of a typical male. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I probably would be out there spending my Bitcoin like, fucking crazy yes yes <laughs> rail bedford would definitely be getting in the <laughs> yeah. premier league yeah i would say i would i would sign line or messy yeah <laughs> I, yeah uh, yeah of course he would yeah it's um it, it is just such a it's it's good sometimes just to sit, sit back and wonder at all of this and 
wonder at the creation, wonder at Satoshi, and just appreciate what it is because you know we can easily sit here and talk about what's going to happen with an ETF. Is it going to get approved? Is there going to be a mining bloodbath, as I asked you yeah. earlier? But actually, just to sit back and appreciate the beauty of the design, flick around the meme, the mempool and have a look at. I always say meme pool. Yeah, uh, the mempool and, and appreciate it, and um, you know, look at the charts and you know, just. I mean, this itself, when you when you look at this, you don't have something like the mempool for Visa or MasterCard. You no. don't sit there and see live what's yeah. happening. There. You don't have yeah. this fully transparent yeah. system yeah. that tells you exactly what's going on. You can't see it for stocks or even bonds or like this sort of real-time data. I mean, it, it, it... And people are scared of this. Yeah. Well, if you if you live in that other world, yeah, that's that's why you're scared of it because... The power is of the power of information, right? The power of transparency. There is, there is this. I meant to say it to Parker when we interviewed him earlier. There is a huge gulf between people who don't know Bitcoin, don't understand it. See, my like friends of mine or Danny's, what they think about Bitcoin and what they think about what it means to us, and then this reality of where we actually are and what we think about, and what we talk about. Yeah. And bridging that gap is is it's, a, it's been a, it's a real challenge. Yeah, but the, it, it, the, most of them, I think, even some Bitcoiners don't realize how advanced we really are. Like how far we've mm. come in that fifteen years. Mm. And like when you see a metric, for instance, you know the Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin network processes more value annually than Visa or Mastercard. Not transactions, but mm -hmm. more value is being resolved through this network, that's a jaw-dropping number. And it'll stop people in their tracks. Some of the detractors, you can stop them in the tracks with something like that because they, they still perceive it in almost its infancy state of a small group of people trading small amounts of money for drugs or gambling or mm. sex or whatever, right? Instead of, no, there's massive economic value moving through this thing. And it moves 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't take Christmas off. It, it It's always there. Never breaks. It never breaks. Yeah. I mean, that's part of why you asked me, like, why I like mining. Like, I just, I love the fact that all day, you know, when we, what we build, like within my company, like what we built, it's just, they're chunking every single day. And while I'm sleeping, it's serving people in the Philippines or Thailand or Australia. And yeah. I, I, I just really get a kick out of that. Bob, we've... Um We've hit the point where we're going to have to stop, and there's a reason. I'll tell you in a minute. But uh, we didn't cover 90... Do you know what? I'm going to embarrass you a little bit here. Danny said to me, when we when we were about to do a trip, he says, he always picks out a show, he said, this is going to be your favorite show. And sometimes he's right. I'm always right. <laughs> he's usually right. And he said on this one, he's like, uh, Bob Burnett's going to be your favorite one. And I was like, no, it's not, because it's mining. I was like, I like Bob, but it's not. I know what interviews we've got coming. And this is just like, it's like flown by. It's like, like, this has just flown by and we haven't touched loads <laughs> of things I want to do. And now my question is, when can we sit down again? Because there's like a whole bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about. Um, well, let's, let's do it soon. Where are you based? I'm based in Florida. Okay, we will figure this out. Are you yeah, going to be at the mining you, summit yeah. in January in Nashville? Uh, I hadn't planned, but you know it's easy for me to travel. So if if you guys want yeah. me there, I will be there. We definitely do because I I want and I we I want us to do Satoshi's heel, and we've not even touched. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, can we can we just block out a big block for yeah, this yeah. one? Um, the reason the reason we have to pause now is uh, we're Rail Bedford are about to play, and we're going to put on the TV. So we awesome. hope you stay and join us. I'll stay for a little while. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bob, is there any way you want to send people? Uh, barefootmining.com uh, is our website. And you know, if you want to learn about how we mine, and we have a little different approach than some others, uh, and on Twitter, I'm boomer underscore BTC. Mate, honestly, I love this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love you guys. <laughs>